Good morning. Good morning. Uh, special congratulations to uh, Jonah Goose, who was elected by acclamation, the assistant Democratic leader of our caucus this morning. Um, we also sent our um, heartfelt uh, condolences to the Kildee family as they navigate a loss in their uh, in their family. Uh, the caucus uh, extended that uh, to uh, Representative Kildee, and we look forward to welcoming him back uh, on his own timeline uh, with with open arms. On January 6th, Donald Trump urged a violent mob to attack the United States Capitol and the people inside it. It's not subject to interpretation. This is a fact. There's no doubt that he would do it again, and why I've said from this podium that he represents a clear and present danger to democracy. His comments over the weekend suggesting that if he were to lose the election, there would be a bloodbath in this country should be taken both literally and seriously. His attacks against the January 6th committee only reinforce the accuracy of our findings that Donald Trump was at the center of a conspiracy to overturn a free and fair election, and he would do it again. For the American people who may think that this is just hyperbole and that these attacks don't affect them, I would simply say our veterans, our nation's heroes, sacrificed their lives to protect this country, our way of life, and our democracy. Donald Trump would sacrifice our way of life in a heartbeat if he thought that it could bring him political power. He doesn't belong anywhere near the Oval Office, and don't just take our word for it. The, vice, the former Vice President, his former Chief of Staff, his former Defense Secretary, and his former Secretary of State all agree. And let's be clear, the dysfunction we see today, taking a vote to avoid a government shutdown for the fifth time in this Congress, is because the Republican Party has sold out lock, stock, and barrel, and because Donald Trump and MAGA extremism continue to permeate under this dome. Vice Chair Ted Lieu. Uh, thank you, Chairman Aguilar. My uh, prayers also go out to Dan Kildee and his family. Recently, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, who was appointed by Republican President George Bush, denied a request from Trump associate Peter Navarro to stay out of prison. Today, Peter Navarro reported to prison because he broke the law. In America, no one is above the law, not the rich, not the powerful, and certainly not associates of the rich and powerful. We in the Democratic Caucus continue to call on Speaker Johnson to put the Senate Supplemental National Security Bill on the floor for up or down vote. It's critical that we get aid to our allies. The simplest, quickest way to do that <laughs> is to have a up or down vote on that supplemental security package. We also have a discharge petition. We call on Republicans who want to put country over party to also sign that discharge petition and have a vote on that critical national security supplemental package. Thank you. Questions? Julie? Oh, okay. okay. Eric? Thank you. Uh, question on the uh, minibus, uh, from what you've reviewed, are you supportive of it? Uh, what are some of the highlights of that from your point of view? And then also on Ukraine, Speaker Johnson was just talking about this idea of loans for Ukraine and also seizing Russian assets. Do other of those uh, ideas make sense to you? Uh, with respect to the minibus, we look forward to, uh, well, first of all, we heard from our um, leaders, uh, Rosa DeLauro and the ranking members of the Committees of Jurisdiction uh, this morning at caucus. Um, I think many of us are waiting to see the details and the text of, of these bills, um, but based on what we have heard from our, our leadership team and, uh, and ranking member DeLauro, uh, we look forward to putting up votes uh, to pass uh, this minibus. Um, most importantly, this uh, continues uh, to make important investments uh, to lower costs that everyday Americans face. Um, we staved off the thousands of poison pill riders uh, that the um, House Republicans in the Appropriations Committee uh, sought to put forward to attack women's reproductive freedom, uh, to attack um, uh, so many um, uh, uh, vital programs that the federal government undertakes, including uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
Um, those are some of the uh, key uh, wins and, and priorities, as well as investments in, in child care, investments in our national defense. Uh, those are things that the caucus is, is proud to support and has advocated. Uh, the fact that uh, Republicans went from uh, proposing cuts of 22 percent last year um, to where we are today uh, speaks volumes to Leader Jeffries and Rosa DeLauro and, and their ability uh, to work to find uh, compromise and, uh, and to fund government. Um, with respect to Ukraine, uh, look, the vice chair said it, said it correctly. Uh, our fastest and most certain way to help provide funds for Ukraine is to pass the bipartisan uh, national security supplemental that the Senate uh, has, has passed. Uh, Mitch McConnell has raised specific questions uh, on the timeliness uh, of our help and support. If we were to send something, anything else short of that uh, over the United States Senate, uh, it could take them uh, weeks or um, longer uh, to, to pass. Um, that's a concern of, of our caucus. Uh, we want to help fund Ukraine. We want to ensure that there's humanitarian support uh, within that package uh, for uh, innocent Palestinians in, in Gaza. Uh, those are priorities of the caucus, and we want to make sure that we implement those. Um, but we will, we will consider, um, uh, we will consider options. Um, but uh, I think the fastest way and the way that uh, Leader Jeffries um, uh, and our leadership team uh, would like us uh, to proceed is uh, to pass a national security supplemental. <coughs> You had mentioned some of the wins uh, with regards to the poison pills and pro-life measures. Speaker Johnson had said that, I guess, the Hyde Amendment and the Helps Amendment made it in. Um, your reaction to, to, to some of these poison pills that Republicans want to put in? Look, some of those are um, uh, legacy writers that have been in appropriations bills when Democrats were in control, you know, as, as well. Uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, that I or, or the vice chair uh, or each of our um, members are, approve of these. Uh, these are just, you know, items that have, um, you know, stood within those bills uh, over time. Uh, I think the important piece is, you know, hundreds and hundreds of writers <coughs> that Republicans put in place in the Appropriations Committee that we told them in committee were never going to become law. Um, but they were there because Speaker McCarthy made a deal uh, with the far, far right of his party to put mem those members on the Appropriations Committee to advocate for these. And those individuals held these bills hostage um, until they got the writers that they, that they wanted. Um, we told them that they were going to become law. Um, they did it anyway. Uh, thankfully, with the leadership of Rosa DeLauro and, and Leader Jeffries uh, and our ranking members in appropriations, we were able to uh, beat those back. Um, and so uh, none of those um, were able to, none of those uh, made it across the finish line. Uh, and I think it's a testament to, you know, how far we've, we've come uh, a little late in this process, later than many of us wanted to. But this is exactly the same place we told our House Republican colleagues we were going to end up. Uh, we told them this in committee in June. Uh, it's taken them this long, um, but ultimately uh, we're passing these these funding bills, and that's what's important. Yes, sir. Julie. If I can just follow up um, on the Ukraine aid question, you said you're going to consider potentially those other options. It sounds like Speaker Johnson's not going to bring this up until you're back from recess in April anyway. Um, is there a, a potential leverage point the Democrats can use, for example, adding humanitarian aid? in Gaza, things that Republican leadership have indicated they don't want to do in exchange for using the repo program or using the uh, loans for non-legal aid? Look, I, I think, um, you know, the vice chair's comments um, are still the, the most timely. Look, this is the, a bipartisan uh, Senate package. Uh, Seventy members in the Senate uh, sent this over. Uh, it was not easy. It was not quick. Uh, it is the fastest way uh, to help Ukraine. Uh, some of those other proposals that have been talked about, there are some legal, you know, pieces and components that probably need to be worked through um, with allies uh, and the administration. Uh, all of that takes time. Um, we want the fastest, most certain path 
uh, to aid going to Ukraine. And, and just, you know, ask some of those national security Republicans who said March 22nd was the date that they were looking at. You know, where is their leadership, you know, on this? Uh, they have been so deferential to Speaker Johnson throughout this, saying he, he has a plan or he will have a plan. Um, what they should be doing is putting uh, democracy first, uh, uh, putting uh, the, the uh, priorities that Ukraine has advocated um, forefront before their own, um, you know, party uh, leadership and ideology. This is about our national security priorities, uh, and that should take precedence um, over uh, the deference that they are offering uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, and so that's what we're asking our colleagues. They can sign the discharge petition, as the vice chair said. They can work with us on other ways to bring this to the floor in a in a clear and prompt manner. Um, but everything else that they've said is just lip service if they're not willing to actually do something uh, to make that happen. Nick? What does it say about the workings of this institution that Democrats are going to have to put up the votes to get the funding bill over the finish line? This is just the latest thing coming up under, under suspension, whether it was the TikTok bill, tax bill, appropriations. Um, why not let Republicans hang out to dry? Well, because our, our caucus believes in governing. Um, you know, ultimately, we, we all wake up and we come here wanting to make people's lives better, uh, wanting to try to find a way to get to yes to support pieces of legislation uh, to improve people's lives. That's what the Democratic caucus does. That's why um, uh, Ted and I are so privileged to be able to play this role uh, to help guide these discussions because that's just who we are. Uh, we're not interested in scoring political points and letting um, Republicans, you know, fail at, 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 uh, at passing bills that are important for our national security or to fund government. Uh, we want to govern. But I think, you know, within that political lens, Nick, it's not lost on me that you know, truly, the, uh, his title may not be Speaker of the House, um, but definitely uh, leader of the Democratic Caucus and probably leader of the Congress is Hakeem Jeffries. Um, he has the, the, the votes. He has the confidence of a significant portion of members. Uh, five times we have now funded and we will put up the majority of the votes uh, to fund government because ours is a group and a caucus uh, that believes in governing. I agree with everything Chairman Aguilar said. As you saw what happened this term, uh, Democrats were their adults in the room, and we put up their votes on critical bills to prevent a catastrophic default on our nation's debts, to keep our government running. And what are Republicans doing? Stupid stuff. Literally today, they're holding yet another hearing trying to impeach Hunter Biden with, like, some guy named Tony Bobulinski. Like, who is that guy? Like, why does America even care? The star witness for the Republicans was recently indicted by the Department of Justice for lying about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. And public reporting is that that star witness also met with Russian intelligence. So literally, we have Republicans doing stupid stuff, spreading Russian disinformation, and you have Democrats here trying to help American families and trying to make sure that our country moves forward. I think some of us were just surprised. Usually. Republican witnesses get indicted after they testify to Congress. They're actually bringing in someone from jail to testify. Uh, so um, it's just an interesting turn of events uh, by the majority. Uh, Michael, then Chad. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since we're on the home stretch of the appropriations process, I want to get your thoughts on this laddered CR approach, how you feel it worked out since we're almost six months into the fiscal year and the bills haven't passed yet. What, what is, what's your thoughts on this letter, uh, CR post that the Speaker uh, executed uh, when he, you know, ascended to power? You know, the, the, the important thing is that we're getting these, these done. Um, we're putting these behind us. We're funding government. Um, uh, I do think that this was the laddered approach was something that the speaker made a promise to and then had to kind of create um, some mini buses that that met that threshold uh, and then we delayed those after we said we weren't going to do any delays um, but you know, we're exactly in the position that we knew we were going to end up you know we knew that House Democrats Senate Democrats Senate Republicans uh, and the White House weren't going to tolerate any um, significant, you know, harmful cuts and, and crazy policy writers. Uh, it was only House Republicans who insisted on moving forward. 
um, with those priorities. And so we ended up in the same place that we thought we would. Uh, it's a lesson moving into FY25. Um, I hope our Republican colleagues can tune out the crazy and, and work with us uh, on uh, funding bills on time. Um, and I think we've given the template of what that looks like, uh, even in divided government, uh, that we can meet the needs of the American people, and that's what we should continue to strive for. Chad. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, there seems to be some splits on the Republican side about how much time they should have before they do the minibus. You know, they have the 72-hour rule. What do you think, though, when you have a big bill, trillion dollars, what is the right amount of time to spend on that, considering that we're getting this bill this afternoon and the deadline is Friday? Yeah, I mean, we'll get the we'll get the final text and we'll take a look. Um, uh, you know, I, I think you're asking kind of philosophical questions. I think every member uh, will make their own, you know, decisions and determinations. Uh, some members, um, uh, myself being one of them, we've seen a lot of this text. Um, we may not have seen the exact dollar amount, but we've seen a lot of this text over time, uh, either in prior years or in uh, committee work that, that I do in the Appropriations Committee. Uh, so there aren't a lot of surprises uh, within this, but every member can make their own determination on, on how much time and what process uh, they need in order to uh, get to their, their final uh, decision. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, being in the minority, this is leadership's call. Uh, this is Republican leadership's call on um, uh, when they bring the bill to the floor. Uh, our job is to, no matter the timeline, um, be ready to vote uh, and to reflect the interest of our constituents uh, when we do that. But just as a rank and file member, I mean, how much time do you think you need? As you say, some of this text has been out for a long time. These bills were paid back to last June in some respects. I mean, yeah. how much time does a member, you know, speak for yourself, you know, really need to go through this bill? Yeah, I mean, mine's a little different because I've, I've sat through um, uh, committee presentations and hearings um, specific on the subcommittees I'm in in defense. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of that language uh, over the last few years and sat with witnesses who have helped shape the um, financial priorities, the fiscal priorities uh, that are carried forward in, in defense and transportation and the subcommittees I'm on. Um, so my staff and I have spent, you know, uh, uh, a lot of hours, you know, on these uh, on these topics and on these numbers. Um, I think uh, other members, um, when uh, we used to go through a rules process and when we used to have uh, appropriations uh, that that worked, um, and you know, two minute votes um, uh, in the in the summer, and when those were real, um, I think that can be helpful for members. Um, to advocate for their districts, but also to go through the material and go through the detail. I think our final product is so far removed from where House Republicans started and where they uh, and when they did that, uh, where they were able to bring bills uh, to the floor, which was very limited. Um, uh, but uh, I, I leave it to, to members to make those uh, decisions on, on uh, what times. But at different pieces, Chad, the answer is at different points in time, um, members will um, get into those details. Last summer when these bills came to the floor, the ones that did, um, and through this CR process and now, um, you know, when we have more complete text, uh, members will arrive at those decisions. Oh, me. Yeah. Um, so Following uh, Senator Schumer's um, comments last week about Israel, there has been some chatter from Speaker Johnson and other Republicans about a possible Israel standalone aid bill. And I was wondering if Republican leaders had reached out to you guys about that. And depending on that, would there be a path through the caucus for an Israel standalone bill? I read the Speaker's comments last week. I don't have anything more to share. He tried um, doing that in the past. He's tried politicizing. Uh, Israel aid uh, in the past. Uh, we hope that we don't go down that route. Uh, again, uh, what the vice chair said, uh, if we are truly interested in helping our democratic allies in Ukraine and Israel, um, there needs to be humanitarian assistance associated with the package. That's what we have in the National Security Supplemental. Uh, that should be the priority of uh, the speaker, um, and that should be the priority of, of the House. The speaker said, uh, and the leader has reflected this, um, that you know, the House should work its will. Uh, he hasn't said the Republican conference should work its will. The House should work its will. Um, we're confident that the votes are there uh, for this national security supplemental. Uh, if he was willing to put the bill uh, on the floor, that's what, that's what he should do if he was truly interested in the House working its will. Last question. Um, <clears throat> from this morning's session, I was wondering, um, 
for 16, 17 years, the top troika for the House Democrats was Pelosi, Hoyer, Clyburn. Um, and then with Clyburn's uh, moving off of leadership, um, was there any sort of notation or any sort of observance uh, or uh, in uh, with Nagus taking over today, um, sort of about the sort of end of, for lack of a better term, the, the formal end of, uh, of, of an era? I think um, Joe Nagus, I'm not going to get too much into what happens in, in caucus, but I thought Joe Nagus gave uh, an amazing uh, reflection uh, when he spoke to caucus this morning um, on the contributions of Jim Clyburn. Uh, the contributions he's made to the state of South Carolina, to the Democratic caucus, to the country. Um, uh, I thought he did a, an amazing job, and, and we all stand uh, on the shoulders of Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Jim Clyburn, and their, and their leadership. I've said before, they are the Mount Rushmore of, of Democratic politicians. Um, the fact that we get to benefit from um, from their ideas and their thoughts, even today, uh, we don't have, it's not like you know, picking up the phone and, and calling someone who's left, they're, they're here. They're walking these halls. They're sitting in meetings with us. Um, they're sharing their expertise and their knowledge. Um, it's a benefit to the Democratic Caucus, uh, every member who gets an opportunity to spend with those, with those leaders. Um, but it, particularly uh, for those of us who are in leadership positions now, uh, it's an amazing opportunity to, to learn from them, to listen. Uh, many of us have done that. Um, uh, whether uh, Ted was on the DPCC, I was vice chair, uh, we've sat at these leadership tables, we've been in these meetings and, and heard those dynamics and have seen them lead um, and have learned so much from them. Um, uh, that uh, So I'm, I'm happy that um, Assistant Democratic Leader Nagoose uh, was able to share those reflections about uh, Mr. Clyburn. Uh, I'm certain uh, over time there will be uh, other opportunities uh, to reflect on, on the leadership that he, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer, have continued to provide uh, to the Democratic Caucus. And I'll, I'll tell you, Steny Hoyer presented today as ranking member of Financial Services General Government. Um, so we're not, we're not done uh, getting leadership out of him. Um, and uh, I think it's a tribute to the, to the caucus and to those individuals. Yeah. So I just want to say uh, Mr. Clyburn is a legendary member of Congress uh, who has provided principle inspiring leadership to the Democratic Caucus. His wisdom and experience are irreplaceable, and that's why I'm grateful he will be back next term, continuing to uh, help steer our caucus. And I also want to welcome uh, Joe uh, on his new role. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.